Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast with your hosts, Betsy Westhafer and Tony Bodo. Join Betsy and Tony as they dive in with highly successful C-suite leaders who have grown successful organizations by creating a laser focus on listening to their customers and building deep customer relationships. Now, it's time to join Betsy and Tony for the Really Know Your Customer show. Welcome to the Really Know Your Customer podcast. I'm Tony Bodo, and I'm here with Betsy Westhafer. Today's guest is Nick Ripplinger. And Nick is the founder of a startup called Battlesite. And Betsy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Nick? So Nick has been an entrepreneur for a few years now, post-military career. Uh, seven years in the military, had a phenomenal career, um, was medically retired. Um, not sure what year that was, but in full disclosure, I will tell you that Nick is my oldest child. And I'm super excited to have him here on the show today. We're going to have a great conversation about all things entrepreneur, about technology commercialization, about just the changing market and, you know, when times call for a pivot and all kinds of things. So really excited to have my son, Nick Ripplinger here today. Hi, thank you. So Nick, why don't you kind of give us some background as a starting point, um, some background into your military career, your transition, um, and then how you ultimately ended up where you are today. So I spent seven years in the Army, mostly active duty, a little bit of time in the reserves, did a couple of combat deployments, and rounded out my career working for NATO as the operations NCO, IC, non-commissioned officer in charge uh, for the European command and NATO protective services detachment. And then from there, worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the defense contracting space, went out to industry, and then we formed Battlesite in 2017. So tell us more about Battlesite. Yeah, Battlesite's a rapid commercial technology commercialization company focused on the warfighter, the first responder, and emergency management professional. Uh, our flagship product is a Kratak IR, which is an infrared crayon. It writes basically in the invisible spectrum, but it looks like a chem light or a light stick through night vision goggles. And from there, we've branched out to about six other product lines. So, wait, so tell us a little bit more, just a little more specificity on what that means, technology commercialization company. Yeah, so I would love to say that we're a bunch of inventors here coming up with the greatest ideas, but that's just not really the case. We go out and source technology that was developed in academic labs, DOD research labs, um, private industry labs that have commercial viability, bring them in-house, figure out how to manufacture it, and then commercialize it as quickly as possible. And kind of put that in the timeline. From our first license was November of 2017, and we got to revenue in March of 2018. Wow, wow, that's fast. That's that rapid innovation. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's really what we pride ourselves on is just how fast we can move. Yeah. Well, so it's interesting because as you said, you're not the inventors, but you guys are obviously taking it to the market. So you're the innovators, but you've got to identify what technology do we think we can turn into a commercial product? You know, so there's, there's a whole lot of, of understanding who the customer would be which is, you know, one of the things we're really interested in on this show, you know, the Really Know Your Customer podcast. So how did you, let's take the, the first product. How did you really come up with the idea that we can take this particular technology and turn it into uh, essentially an infrared crayon, uh, crayon, I guess is the best way yeah, to say it. absolutely. So this technology was actually brought to me by a mentor. So that was a huge hurdle. Like the technology was brought to us. And as he was pitching this technology to me, I kind of zoned out in the middle of the meeting, to be honest with you. And I started thinking of all the use cases that I would have personally used a product like this while I was in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else in the world doing training missions. And that's really when it clicked is I know for a fact there's a market out here because I would have been the customer for this a few years ago. And what did that look like? Give, give us an example of, of an application where, you know, probably in that meeting you're sitting there thinking about like, gosh, I could have used it here or here or here. Yeah, and that's kind of been the fun part about it. So the original use case was if you think about clearing a building, you kick in the front door and you go room by room and capture whoever needs captured. And then once that whole building's locked down, then you'd go back through and grab all the intel. 
So each step of the way you're throwing traditional glow sticks, chem lights into each room is a way to communicate. But if you kick in a door of a room that, or a building that you think has 20 rooms and you need 40 chem lights to clear it, but it turns out it has 50 rooms and you needed 100 chem lights and you only had 60, now you're searching the same areas multiple times. Some areas aren't getting searched at all. And it really broke down the communication and those type of uh, missions. So now you can just go right on the wall and one cray tack replaces about a thousand chem lights. And if you have, you know, 10, 12 guys on a mission, all of a sudden you're carrying, you know, 10 to 12,000 chem lights. So you're never going to run out. That's kind of the primary use case, but I'm sure we'll get to this here in a second, but we spend a lot of time out in the field with our customers. And it's just amazing to me. We say this all the time is that we have the best customers in the world. They're the smartest, most brightest men and women in the world they all have their own little unique twist on how they can use the Craytag product for their specific missions. What are some of the other creative applications you've seen for it that would have never occurred to you when you were bringing this to market? Yeah. So the guys in the military that I don't think get nearly enough respect are the EOD, the bomb disposal guys. And so they're taping it to their boot and using it every time they step, they're putting a dot on the ground and using it to breadcrumb a way into a potential IED or roadside bomb site so should they have to send a robot or another guy with tools that they know the safe way that's not going to set off the bomb and then the medics are using it to treat a casualty under blackout conditions to write on the foreheads of when do they give morphine when what time do they put the tourniquet on so that way when they get back to the hospital they can still capture all that without actually giving away their position using light so explain to us how the infrared spectrum piece of this works and why that's important yeah so the infrared spectrum is like right outside of the red spectrum in the light scale and it's invisible to the naked eye so you can ride in a dark room and not be able to see anything but with the use of night vision goggles it sees in that infrared spectrum and it actually our product produces a light that is visible through the night vision goggles and, and why that matters is because oh uh, sorry because you know we we win wars because we own the night and that's somebody else's tagline that I wish I would have came up with, but we really do because we have such a technology superiority against most of our adversaries. So we conduct missions at night where we can see and they can't and just kind of keeps that element of surprise, but it's a huge tactical advantage to be able to visually communicate in those low light, no light situations. So you were in this space, you were a warfighter yourself, you have been on the front lines. And when this technology is presented to you, you get some ideas that come to mind. As you were, you were talking to us and when we did our prep for the show, and I found it interesting because, and you alluded to a little bit here, you said, we work with the, the smartest men and women in the world. So as, as, you, as you look at that, what were some of the things that you thought might work, but as you got to know your customer, you realized we've got to shift, we've got to pivot this. Yeah, so the very first time we debuted the product, the Craytac product, you know, we spent, you know, six months working between the license and on the development side of things. And we're about to launch our baby out to the world. And right, our baby's the best looking baby in the world. There's nobody better than our baby. And we take it out and we're in a big conference with a ton of special operation forces guys. And we show them the product and we take them into a dark room and we get these, you know, amazing reactions. And they come out of the dark room. And they're like, hey, we love how your technology works, the way it writes, all that's awesome. The way you packaged it absolutely sucks. And it's like, boom, all the wind comes out of our sales. Like, do we just waste, you know, all of our personal money that we invested into this company in over six months to, you know, deliver a shitty product, which was not our goal by any means. So during that time, the few people that commented on the packaging and how the function of the physical function of the product, not the visual functions. We just simply asked them, Hey, do you mind leaving us our e your email address? We'd love to bring you into the development cycle. We agree with you based off what you said that this is not going to work, but if you guys like the technology, we want to fix this and put this into an application that works for you. And we'd love for you to be part of that development process. And everybody said yes. So as we're recatting out designs and coming up with new ideas of how to manufacture this, that meets their needs, we had, you know, four or five special operation forces who directly input, their input directly impacted how we developed our product. So that way, when round two comes or when round two came around, when we launched the product for commercial sales to the government, we were able to capture those sales because 
we had our customer there every step of the way during the development for the form fit and function. I love that because it really goes to show how many different ways you can leverage your customers. You know, you, you leveraged them in a way that they were able to help you with the use cases. You were able to leverage the customer input for the product design. Um, I'm sure that through the course of all of this, you've gotten a lot of other ways that you've engaged with your customers in a way that really helps you accelerate your, your progress. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that probably says the best is we do leverage our customers, but it's not in like a salesy, sleazy type of tactical or tactical way. It's more in the innovation side of things, which then turn around and leads to an awesome product, which leads to sales so that you don't have to be salesy on. But our second product, our Nightfall product line, we we're actually doing a Kratak demonstration in our shop for, which is the Cram. He's like, hey, can you guys float this chemistry on water? I was like, man, I have no clue, but I've got water, I've got beakers, and I've got the chemicals. Let's try it out. So we get a five-gallon bucket, fill it up with water, mix up some of the chemicals in the cram in liquid form, and it floats on water. So we observe it and it doesn't last that long, but there's enough of a proof of concept that, hey, there might be something there. And this all came back to a uh, aircraft crash that happened with a uh, captain – Marine Corps Captain uh, Rizzolard in an F-35 kind of hit an F, uh, excuse me, a C-130. And both aircrafts went down in the Sea of Japan. We were able to rescue all the C-130 pilots because it's a big cargo plane. It's super easy to find. The pilot punched out of the fighter and the plane went about 100 miles. And they recovered Captain Rizzolard at the 11 hour mark. And according to his Apple Watch, he passed away at the nine and a half hour mark so if we could have put out a signal that could have been detected you know from air from farther distance away we could have really increase that chance of rescue over recovery but that's a hundred percent a product that you know is in the process of commercialization right now that came directly from our customers needs and without that engagement and without pulling them in on the Craytech stuff we would have never one known about the problem two that we had the solution sitting right here in our shop and then three, we were able to use that customer to help us support a development contract with the Air Force. And then you also had the opportunity to go field test that in Okinawa, correct? Yeah, which was amazing. It's, well, one, Okinawa is beautiful if you've never been. And two, it's, it was really humbling to be out there and be on the same flight line where these you know planes took off that we were there solving the problem. And then actually being up in the air and hanging out of the back of the C-130 and really understanding our customers' challenges. Like we heard the stories, but it's, until you've actually been in those shoes, it was so hard to comprehend what they were trying to tell us. And then, you know, the product exceeded all of our expectations, which also made it a really fun trip. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good too. So one of the things I think was interesting too, is you talked about on, on our prep call, you, you were saying the reason that, that you can really have these conversations and that, that your customers are willing to open up to you is because you've been there. Talk, talk a little bit more about what that meant as a warfighter um, and what it means now that you can go back and have these conversations. Yeah. You know, I think our military men and women get targeted for sales as soon as they get out of basic training, right? They've got a guaranteed government paycheck. They've got some fringe benefits that, you know, put money in their pocket as well. And, I feel like they're always getting sold to and it's kind of the feel around the military culture. So when you're able to go in there and one, you know, Hey, we've all been through the same basic training. We've been through some of the same schools. We kind of live the same life. It breaks down those barriers that you can just have an actual conversation where they aren't skeptical of what are you trying to sell us? Is this snake oil or is this something that's actually going to impact our mission? And you know, that's kind of the one thing we, Every time I deployed, I had a footlocker of gear that I just never used because it didn't meet, you know, what I needed on the missions. And so we, you know, vowed we're never going to build a product that just sits in a tough box. We want all of our products out there and actually being used and being worked. And so I think when we explain that to the customers, we show them the product, and it's just a natural conversation between like siblings almost. It really is a brotherhood, sisterhood, and you know. Being the customer prior to, you know, being the salesperson, it really does break down a ton of those barriers for us. So Nick, I happen to know that in your physical location, 
you have a lot of um, salutes to the people you serve. You've got different military branch flags. You've got um, a, a piece of a, a fighter plane on your wall. You have a lot of things that show your commitment to your customers. But talk a little bit about your culture and how you implement your sentiment toward your brotherhood to the other people in your company. Yeah, you know, I think culture, there's, I mean, there's millions of books probably written on this subject, but culture really does start at the top. And it's like my biggest fear as a CEO, entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it, is that we're going to wreck this amazing culture that we built. So it's something that we spend every morning talking about and spend a ton of time and energy making sure we keep it. But like you did say, we do have the flags of our customers up and we do have the American flag off a of fighter jet hanging on our wall. And when we were early on and we were just starting to hire, you know, this, how do we make sure we keep this culture going? And so we decided that we're going to go with, every step of the way we can with hiring veterans or hiring military family members or somehow affiliated to the military. So they have that own personal ownership in the mission. And so right now we're a hundred percent veteran owned. We are a hundred percent military affiliated employer. We have, you know, an army mom, we have some veterans. It's, we've got a military brat on the team and in, that whole team is bought into that mission because they've all been personally impacted by our end customers. So you've got this, this credibility that, you know, from all different perspectives that you can apply to the situation. Um, but there's, there's something else that I sense just in the conversation we're having here, you've got this, this deep sense of humility and, and a, a vulnerability. I mean, we just, I can hear it in the stories that you're, that you're sharing and you've talked a, a little bit about, um, how things have changed, you know, from when you left the military and, and starting battle site, there was a gap there of several years and what the warfighter needed really changed, what the missions were really changed. So how did, how did you approach that? Like, okay, we've got the credibility, but we've got to learn, we've got to figure out where they're at today. Yeah. And I think a lot of that was done during that development of Kratak is kind of what laid that foundation for us is, you know, we thought we designed the greatest thing ever and then it sucked. So, you know, just when we learned that when we could ask our customers for feedback and to be part of the development process, we're like, wow, this is like kind of a no brainer, but I just never hear anybody talking about it. So now every time that we take on a development project or we're looking at a new piece of technology, we go out and source those end users our you know, potential customers to be part of us during that development cycle. So we've partnered with the Air Force, we've partnered with uh, several Army units, and really just trying to source out their problems and then try to go pair that with technology and then bring in those champions or stakeholders on the customer side to really help you know, do that uh, development progress. And I think having that customer in there is a lot what allows us to move as quickly as possible or as quickly as we do. I love that phrase, sourcing out the customer's problems. I've never heard that phrase before, but that's really a, a lot of the lines of the work that we do with customer advisory boards is just sourcing out those problems, trying to get to the root of what their problems are. So I love the way you phrase that. I'm totally um, trademarking this after this call. Well, you should. You should. <laughs> um, so we're in the throes of the coronavirus crisis and you've done some pivoting as many companies have. So tell us a little bit about one, what you've done, but two, what was your thought process to actually get you to the move you made? Yeah. So if it's cool with you, I'll tack this from the thought process uh, parts first. So coronavirus hits, we lose, you know, half of our staff that's still on the payroll, but they were just uncomfortable being out in public for their own personal needs. And we are obviously fully supportive of that. I'm not trying to put anybody at risk for battle site. And our COO, Chris and myself, we were sitting around our desk, maybe having an adult beverage or two, trying to figure out what we're going to do in this future. or this, you know, pandemic stage that we're living in right now. And we're walking around our shop. We're looking at, you know, what skill sets do we still have that are able to work? What assets do we have on our shop floor that we can put to work? And what industry connections do we have to actually pull something together? And so with our Kratak product, it's a hot pour of wax 
um, that has a lot of automated like pumps and everything else to fill these behind it. So we got started thinking about hand sanitizer. Like, all right, who do we know in the hand sanitizer business? So we call up our chemical supplier who's right up the road. Said, hey, do you guys have, do you guys make hand sanitizer? Could you guys get it for us? And so at that time, they were also in the process of switching over their production to hand sanitizer. So the stars kind of aligned that we were able to get a source that wasn't publicly known for hand sanitizer and that we had the equipment and the labor to be able to fill them. But we wanted to kind of take it a step further, right? It's crazy times for everybody. So we sourced some bottles and we decided, hey, we're going to be able to sell a third of these and cover our costs and keep our employees engaged, which was our number one priority. And these other two thirds that we have, let's just bottle it and donate it to first responders and the military and anybody who needs it, who's also a potential customer. So it is kind of self-serving that we're flowing that out to our customers, but they really are the ones on the front lines, whether it's a war, whether it's riots or whether it's a pandemic. Very good. And so how did that, how did that transition from Craytac manufacturing to hand sanitizer bottle filling process? How did that go for, for you? Uh, you know, it went, it was crazy because the first supply of hand sanitizer we got, got sold out from underneath of us with a duffel bag of cash at the loading dock. <laughs> Cause that's the crazy times that we live in right now. Um, turns out our equipment did not actually work with the hand sanitizer the way we thought it did. So we, went to Uline or Granger or some, you know, supply store and we got manual pumps and we manually pumped about, I think it was 1200 gallons that we moved so far with manual vacuum pumps, but we were able to move all the material we got and we were able to, you know, flood the Dayton market with uh, well over a thousand bottles of free hand sanitizer to the first responders. That's what I love. I've seen a lot of, and we've talked about this on the show before, we've just seen so many companies being scrappy like that. You know, this is the time to be scrappy. Um, so I think that's really awesome. And I'm not really sure if scrappy is the word I'd use for that, to be honest with you, not to make anything, anybody else sound bad. But I think it's like entrepreneurs or CEOs or business leaders, right? We just solve problems. Yeah, There's that's a, a good point. a massive problem going out there what resources assets do we have that we can go out and solve a problem and add value to our community? Well said, well said. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk to you about is you won an innovation award a couple of years ago and in, in the process of winning that award, you talked a lot about the community effort that it took to get you where you were. So can you talk to our audience a little bit about how it takes a, a village really to build a company and, and all of your strategic partnerships? Yeah, I'd love to say this was all me, but that's just not really the case. I've actually only played a very small fraction in the whole, you know, scale up of battle site. Um, so we, we licensed the technology from the Air Force. So that was the first strategic partner. We realized we had no clue what we were doing. So we go back to the Air Force and we actually wrote Air, the Air Force a contract to assist us in facilitating the knowledge transfer. Uh, started working directly with the inventor to get that done. We then realized that we still weren't really good at making this. So we went to go find a supplier who could produce our micro capsules for us. They happened to be up the road and they kicked off an internal uh, development effort. We put some funding behind uh, part of their internal development, which is really the game changer for the success of battle site. Then we worked with a local contract manufacturer and ran a development effort with those guys, learned what we needed to learn, and then brought the manufacturing back in house. And then on the sales side, it's, everything's almost been word of mouth from our engagement with our customers and sending out samples that they tell their buddies and then we send them samples and it's just kind of grown organically on the sales side that way. So it sounds like the, the whole process here, which this is something that we don't get into a lot. I, I, I think it, you don't see enough in business books and um, in podcasts. It's, it's all the, the people that get involved, the partnerships, the failure again and again and again. And 
but with each step of that is learning something new. And that's the critical part, pull out, okay, what can I do? What can I learn? And, and going back to the story you were telling about the switch over to the hand sanitizer, it was interesting the way you worded that you said, what can we do with the skills we have, with the equipment we have? And that strikes me as such a valid question for anyone to be looking at these days. You know, it's, it's not just the physical, tangible stuff you've got. What are the intangibles that you have? What are your processes in place? What are your, your, your knowledge, your partnerships, your relationship? I mean, you tapped into all of those things. And I think for people just to, you know, even though we focus on the customer a lot, sometimes it's about how do you step back and really look at yourself? How could we reinvent ourselves for an entire, uh, an entirely new purpose, if you will, and, and follow that? So in your perspective, what's the mindset of the entrepreneur and what types of things do they need to be aware of that they leverage and what do they have to avoid so they don't fail? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we talk about the most at Battlesite is we leverage our military background more than we do, you know, master's degrees or college degrees or anything like that. And it's really that refusing to fail. It would have been really easy when somebody told us our product sucked to just say, all right, we're done. It sucks. We can't sell it. But we refused to fail and we kept moving forward and we pulled those customers in. I, so I guess probably resilience is probably the number one thing. And then things to avoid for failure, I think it's just, you know, being humble and, you know, being fully transparent with yourself of what you're good at, what you're not good at, and then go surround yourself with people that can make up those shortcomings for you. That's awesome. So what, what is your favorite part of being the leader of an organization that serves the military? Definitely the happy hours. <laughs> you know, I think it's the experiences we get to go out and do like flying in the back of a C-130 over the sea of Japan, overlooking you know, the mountains of Okinawa was amazing. And it's, you know, the time that we spend in the clubhouse doing the mission prep and the time that we're doing it, the mission debriefs, because all of those are insights that we're getting from our customers that we can potentially turn into a product. And really that product is just going to solve one of their problems, which is the whole reason why we're in business. So one of the things I find really interesting about your story is that it's always about being there with the customer and actually you're discovering things while you're side by side with them. And as I look at most other companies, they don't seem to really get out there and be with their customers side by side. I think the only story, and this comes out of the Dayton, Cincinnati area, is the, the P&G story of the Swiffer and how they literally sat in homes and videotaped, you know, most often women, but they were cleaning their homes and that's how they discovered, hey, why don't we put a wet wipe on the bottom of a stick and turn that into a product, right? It's, it's from being there that they get these insights. So talk a little bit more, if you can, about the, the essence that you think really matters for companies like if they don't get out there with their customer how likely are they to succeed yeah i don't think if you're engaging your customers you have any chance of success there might be some oddballs here and there but i mean all of our great ideas that aren't really our great ideas have all came from sitting in those team rooms and having those conversations i think this kind of is what makes you know battle site somewhat unique but i feel like every company can do it is breaking down those barriers with our customers, having them feel comfortable enough to tell us, Hey, this is a real problem for us. And here's the real results. Is there anything you guys can do for it? And then, you know, sitting around brainstorming back in napkins type development co concepts that then we can go back and execute on. And I think the execution is the other part is, you know, it's in that story with P and G it's great that they identified, we put a wet wipe on the bottom of a stick that's only half the problem. The other half of the problem is actually going out and executing and putting the wet wipe on the bottom of the stick and then going out and selling it. So, you know, there's a phrase that we use, you know, again, stolen from the military is violently execute today at battle site. Every day we're going to make progress and we're going to move that ball forward. Sometimes it's, you know, a football field. Sometimes it's only a yard, but every day showing up and violently executing and advancing the mission of the company. Oh, I love that. That's, that's such a good phrase. 
Um, Nick, I know that you do a lot in your community. So tell us about some of the things on the show. We really like to give our guests a chance to do a shout out to different organizations that you're involved in. And we'll put the links to those organizations in the show notes. But tell us a little bit about your community give back. Yeah, you know, I think the community. So I live in Dayton, Ohio, well, just south of Dayton, Ohio, but our shop's in Dayton, Ohio. And the Dayton community has been absolutely phenomenal to Battle Site. And, you know, we all feel a sense of, you know, obligation not to screw up Battle Site so we can keep being an economic driver in the community. And two is how can we give back? And so we do a lot with veterans because that's a way for us to recruit and it's just the right thing to do in my mind. Um, we also do a lot of work with the Red Cross this hand sanitizer deal, giving it away to the first responders out there on the front lines. Um, through an organization through the Chamber of, Com or the Dayton Chamber of Commerce is the Generation Dayton program, which is helping, you know, breed the next leaders of the community. I know I'm tied to Dayton for the rest of my life. Like this is my home. This is where I want to plant my flag. I want to make sure, you know, the next great entrepreneurs and business leaders in the community have resources and everything they need to be successful and kind of keep Dayton being the great community that it is. That's awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal interview and for us really being able to understand how you go through rapid innovation and take that idea that, you know, someone else has had and bring that to market has been fascinating. And it really comes back to, as you've been saying the whole time, really listening to the customer and just being humble enough to hear what they have to say and to look at, their problem and find that solution, however that's going to come about. So thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, no, thank you guys. I appreciate it. It's been a blast. Thanks, Nick. You know, I love this interview with Nick because from my perspective, he has lived that mindset of the entrepreneur, although he didn't come about it in the traditional way. I mean, he started in the military and was there for seven years, but he got this whole idea of resilience and uh, there's no failure. There's always a way to move forward. And so that mindset, is really what a good entrepreneur has anyway, and it was instilled in him by the military. Yeah, and I have to say, on a personal note, as we mentioned at the top of the show, um, Nick's my son, and we talk every day about business, and I have learned so much from him and his military experience. I feel like I've gotten kind of second secondhand benefit of his military time because I've learned so much about that persistent and persistence and you know, just busting through brick walls. And I've had the chance to see the behind the scenes of battle site from day one to where they are now. And they met a tremendous amount of challenges. And as an entrepreneur, you just always have to have that mindset that you'll, you'll figure it out. And so, you know, whenever I do have the chance to talk with Nick and there's a challenge, I always say the same thing. He's probably tired of hearing it, but it's always my same mantra. It's like, you always figure it out. And he does. He always figures it out. And I think that's such a, a great quality for an entrepreneur and, and something that I've gotten great value from. I also really liked how he talked about um, using the customers in a way that helps with product development. And I think that's such an important concept. It's something that we do in the customer advisory boards, but to think about it in terms of people out in the field on the battlefront, you know, just, I think it's just a really interesting um, example of how no matter who your customers are, that you can get their input on your product development and the packaging and all of those kinds of things. Um, so I just thought it was a really um, interesting way to look at customer engagement. Yeah, and it's interesting because he obviously does a lot of B to G, you know, business to government sales, but his his true consumer is the the warfighter or the first responder, the person on the front lines. And so while he is listening to who he needs to listen to from the purchasing side and all of that, his focus is so clearly on the end consumer that that helps him avoid some of the other obstacles in the path and the contracting side of things and that because they need the product. They want the product on the front lines. And so it gets there. And one of the things you said, you know, you're, you're saying to him that you'll figure it out. You know, that could come across as, as trite and it could come across as dismissive. But honestly, in his case, because he keeps going back to the customer, that's why he can always figure it out. And I was really struck because a lot of the work that, that I do in the customer experience from the ground up listening to customer feedback and helping companies really look at it 
from the perspective of what are the problems your customer is having in life, not just with your product. In fact, let's set that aside for a moment. Let's look at what's going on in their lives. This is what Nick does all the time. And I think why they can you know, pivot from, okay, we've got product A, how do we use that for product B and product C and product D? And so I think that's really a key to success here is understand the big picture of your customer. And the more you're with your customer, actually side by side with them, you know, looking out of the back of a C-130, you know, that, that, that's pretty telling as far as how he is really understanding what's going on in their life. And I think it's important for any company, anyone listening to this, take some notes about that. What is it you could do to be side by side with your customer? How can you get out there in the field with them? This goes beyond journey mapping, you know, customer journey mapping in the boardroom. You've got to be out there with them in their lives, in their businesses, understand what's going on so that you can actually find problems and then source the solution. Yeah, I think the other thing too that that really kind of touches my heart about this is just that veteran entrepreneurial spirit. And um, we didn't mention at the top, but Nick wrote a book called um, Frontline Leadership, Applying Military Strategies to Everyday Business. And in that book, he has experiences that he had in the military and the lessons he learned through those experiences and how those same lessons apply in business. And so I think that's a good lesson for all of us that no matter what your experiences are, you look for what you're going to learn from them and then, okay, how can I now apply that in my business? So um, I just think, I think it's um, just a really good lesson for all of us to, to be reminded of that. So that will wrap up today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it, got a lot of value out of listening to Nick's story about Battlesite Technologies, and we look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Really Know Your Customer. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Really Know Your Customer. We hope you gained a lot of value from being here today. If you want to learn more about the work Betsy and Tony do to help their clients thrive, Visit Betsy at thecongruitygroup.com and Tony at TonyBodo.com. See you next time on the Really Know Your Customer Show.